I trust that the spirit of God will continue to work in our midst, doing new things, doing great things in Jesus' mighty name. Yeah. This third quarter, you know, the, the theme for the year is season of life. And the theme for this third quarter is the law of life. We will be considering messages around the law of life in this third quarter of the year 2023. And we will be opening um, a series of messages this morning with um, a message around the theme of the law of life. Titled it the greatest commandment. Amen. You know when you hear commandment, it's also read there as the law. Amen. So we'll be looking at the greatest commandment this morning. Join me as we read together from the book of Matthew, chapter number 22. Hallelujah. I observe that um, we are having some little technical challenge with our media system. So we will make do to quickly follow me as quickly as you can. Thank God they are able to create the scriptures. Matthew chapter 22, I will read from verse 34. Matthew chapter 22 from verse 34. If you are there, say hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Somebody say first and greatest. Ah, great. Sorry, sorry. That, the scripture say great. Somebody say first and great. First and great. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. Bible will introduce this section by saying that the, introducing the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Many of us, I'm sure you, have, you are familiar with these two different schools, two different religious schools. I've talked a lot of times about them, but for the sake of maybe refreshing our memory again, we have these two different religious schools during the days of Jesus' ministry here on earth, and the Sadducees belong to the school that don't believe in life after death. They don't believe in heaven. They don't believe there is hell. Even though they believe there is God, but their belief is that once you are dead, you are annihilated. The, the theory or the teaching of annihilation, that is, once a person is dead, he ceases to exist, it doesn't exist again, and the relation. So their, their relationship with God is just to follow God to be good people here on earth and enjoy life. So they are the ones that bear rule over the temple. They are the ones in charge of the temple. They are the ones that dress in expensive robes and garments. They, they, they are flamboyant, they are rich, they are the ones in control of the resources even though yes they are religious leaders they have their own religious school recall they are the ones that came to tempt jesus and say okay if you say there is heaven when seven brothers had one same wife according to that tradition after they they, 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 they all die and the woman that when they get to heaven whose wife will she be and jesus said oh you don't know what you're saying 
in heaven, you never get married or given in marriage. We are be like the angels. So they wanted to prove that heaven is not a reality. But Jesus was able to shut them down there. Then the Pharisees would come and say, Wow, now that the Sadducees have been shamed, now that all, you know, their theology has been knocked down by the rabbi, that is Jesus, they want to project their own course. So that's, that's what keeps happening. They will now project their own teaching and try to test Jesus or try to look for how Jesus will help promote their own teaching, either to promote their teaching or to drag Jesus down. So here they came to tempt and say, let's even know how much of our theology this man understands, which is the greatest commandment. And Jesus gave them this task. But the main focus of this message is to talk about this great commandment itself. Praise God. The focus is not about the Pharisees' teachings or the Sadducees' teaching. Jesus said, there are two commandments. The commandments are summarized in two. Love the love of your God and love your neighbor as yourself. We are looking at the, the law of life. We want to look at what, what is it? The, the spiritual life. How does it how does it work? What are the things that are required of us? So I'll be starting with this foundation of the commandment itself. Because you know, God made the commandment the foundation of his covenant with the people when he brought them out of Egypt and he was setting them up as a nation. They are grown long. They are, if you like, constitution. Their relationship with God, the grown long of their relationship with God was a temple man. So quickly God had to establish that. That this is the constitution of our relationship. Praise God. And that still forms the foundation of faith and relationship with God. Everything that's got to do with man's faith and conduct, they are still on the foundation of this great document that God released to them, which Jesus um, opened up the world to them and summarized it into these two. Now, we, are, we, we get used to, um, uh, when we get too familiar with some things, sometimes we forget them, but we, we don't take them serious anymore. We take them for granted. So I have taken the liberty today to still compel all of us to go and read that Ten Commandments. Since childhood, they make sure that we know it in the head. Don't say, oh, it's Old Testament. No, who's not told you oh, Old Testament is not from God? It's from God. Praise God. Especially this commandments. Because, oh, this Old Testament, Old Testament, many of us don't regard it anymore. We don't, we don't know it. So if I ask you now, which is the fifth commandment? Okay. Which one is the tenth commandment? Or which one is the second? Which one is the third? Believers know it is in your Bible. It has not expired. And it will not expire. Praise God. So the Ten Commandments as given to the children of Israel, the first one is in... Okay, I will say also that I want to show us that Jesus divided them into two. The, the, you know, the, the first one is in love the Lord your God. Now, the one of love the Lord your, Lord your God is, um, is the first to the fourth commandment, number one to number four. Those are the commandments that relate that has to do with our relationship with God. Then from number five to number ten has to do with our relationship with people, with you know, with one another. But the one that has to do with relationship with God, that's the first and great commandment according to what Jesus said. And he, he, he summed them together, said, Love the Lord your God. So the first one of the four. Is in Exodus. We will be seeing them in Exodus chapter 20. If you please open to Exodus 20, I'm taking from verse 3. Verse 3 is the first commandment. He said, Thou shalt have no 
other gods before me. That's the first commandment. I am the only God. You will have no other God. You will not worship any other God apart from me, Yahweh. The nations around you have their own army of gods. But as far as my relationship with you is concerned, there is only one God. Only one God. So you say you will have no other God. That's the first one. The second one in verse, verse 4 to I think verse um, 6 says that thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. I'm reading verse 4, Exodus 24. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Verse 5, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. So the second commandment says, do not make any image. The first one says, I am the only God. The second one says, you are not permitted to make image of anything to, to worship it, not even my own image. You manage to even have a glimpse of how I look like. Don't make any image of anything. Don't, don't, don't venerate any image. Don't make any image a, 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 an object of your uh, uh, religious focus, devotion, or attention. So don't, don't make the image of Jesus Christ or one human being that they say this is Jesus or this is how Jesus. Don't make that image and hang it somewhere in your room to say this is Jesus. Don't make any image that you will, you will, you, you will be showing some adoration for. Any that image of, of creature, of, of living things or disabled things in heaven, don't make any image. Don't say you saw the, the image of one angel Gabriel somewhere and somebody depicted it for you. And you say, oh, if somebody can look at this and focus on it very well, and uh, you know, you say one, two, one or two incantations in the, in, the, in the guise of speaking in tongues, that something is going to happen to you in the next seven days. That's witchcraft. Some of us will receive messages like that that will say, oh, in the morning, if anybody tap on this thing now and you say this thing to 20 people, I guarantee you in the next soon number of this, God is going to show up, he's going to do this, thing, and then you run to it. You are actually succumbing to witchcraft. This is it. Yeah, Jesus is saying, and God is saying, that don't make image. It will lead you to witchcraft. Do not make images. Hallelujah. The third commandment says that do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Exodus 27. Don't take the name of don't, don't, don't call the name of God carelessly. Don't take the name of the Lord as you know just just anything you just talk, talk. I swear to God. If any small thing, I swear to God. Respect it. In fact, that's the reason why when he will reveal his name, the covenant name to Moses, it was not possible for Moses to say it. He couldn't even write it down. And so we lost that name forever. Nobody knows that name, that covenant name. And it's only one name. All the other names we call God, they are just you know, titles, Adelation, uh, El Shaddai, El Shaddai, the great and mighty one. They are just descriptions. Praise God. The only name that Moses now managed to just coin something, and he gave us what is called the tetra, tetra grammaton Y H W H Yahweh. That's the only name. The only covenant name. Unfortunately, we don't even know how it's pronounced. We don't know. We don't know even the correct letter. Moses put those four letters down to just let you know that there is a covenant name. 
in your spirit man, you can connect to that covenant name that is coined to sound like Yahweh. Or what is called Jehovah. Average Jews today, I'll tell you, I've told you over and over again, an average Jew today, today, even in their worship, even in their Bible, reading their Old Testament, when they come across that thing, they don't call it. Even that why age of age, the Yahweh that we are calling that will say, You are Yahweh, you come and sing it with you. But you won't call that name. So even in the reading of the thing, when they get to uh, that Yahweh, they skip it. Or they give it, they call it, they just give it Adonai. Adonai just means the Lord. Or if they really, really want to say, they will say the name. That's all. They say the name. So when they say, and it came to pass, that we will say, and it came to pass, and Yahweh said, they will say, and it came to pass that the name said, They will not call that name. They, they, an Orthodox Jew will never, even in worship. So God said, that name is not something. And you know it comes in, you, you can see it play out also in all the Semitic cultures and our own African culture. Name is very, very important to us. We respect name a lot. I know of my own culture that I how dare you call the name of your father? You call it his first name. You can't call it him. You can't pronounce it even behind his back. Even when he has discussing somewhere. You can't, you can't pronounce you, 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 you can't pronounce the name of your father. You are, you are addressing your father, you call it his first name. So God is saying that have great respect for that name. It is not a name that is to be pronounced or to be called just anyhow. And I believe that's why it may be so difficult for us to even have, uh, we, don't, we, we are unable to know the accurate pronunciation of that is a covenant name. Now the fourth commandment, Exodus 20 verse 8 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy talks about deep putting aside a day to rest and to worship. Praise God. That's the first. So those four commandments constitute what is in fact of as the, the first commandment, love the Lord your God. I will talk a bit later a bit about that love. Love, that love for dear, agape. Is, the, is what is referred to as the ultimate ethic. Ultimate. That, that, that ethic is very, very, very hard and high. And it is that ethic it is attached to that commandment, love. Love the Lord. Then you move to love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. That love, that Love that word there is also agape. It is the ultimate ethic, ultimate of the love. Let me let me tell you ahead that agape love. I've said it several here. Agape love has nothing to do with feelings or emotions. Love, agape love, has absolutely nothing. To do with emotions. It has nothing to do with feelings. Nothing. All the other uh, uh, love have they are connected with feelings. But agape love is the ultimate and is not tied to feelings. It is it is an ethic that makes a demand upon a person, a demand of uh, how do I put it now? It's a commitment. Have you not wondered why Jesus said you should love your enemies? How can you love your enemies? How is it possible? That is the ultimate ethic. Yes, you can love your enemy even while the person is still your enemy. Love. 
It has nothing to do with you feeling good or feeling nice. So God loves us. The main God love that God has for us is not about God feeling good. Because we can't do anything that will make God feel good. We can't impress Him. But He has, he has established that ethic that binds everything. It, it's part of His essence, His own essence. A commitment to see to it that you look out for the ultimate good in everything. Seeking out that ultimate good many times is very difficult, very uncomfortable, very, very bad when it comes to feeling. Have you thought about it? You know, I thought all oh, some time ago that Jesus, when Jesus said, how can I carry this cup? Please let this cup pass over me. That cup that he's talking about there, <laughs> you know, if you think that Jesus was only doing any drama, it was not a drama. Right there at Gethsemane, he wished to, he, he, wanted, he wanted out. He truly, truly did not want to continue. That <laughs> it's, it's still submitted. Ultimate ethic. He didn't find it funny at all. When the reality dawned on him that what this cup means is that I am going to be cut off, even if it's for a millisecond, I'm going to be cut off from the Father's. A, a, a relationship, cut off from the Father. And if you can picture what happened on the cross, the meaning of the cross, the Bible tells me that it pleased God. It pleased God to, to, for our, all, all this, our sins, our troubles, for Him to be punished. Just imagine, He pleased God. They are nailing Him to the cross. Yeah? And God was saying, Yes, 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 that's it, that's it. It's incredible. You know what that is? What, what, what was happening is that the thing that he wants to achieve, the redemption of all mankind, it requires that that had to be done. He, he desired that above any other thing. Love the Lord your God. It's not about any feeling good. It's not, if you, are, if you are waiting to feel good about God, to be able to love God and say, Oh God, you are my all in all, I love you so much because you did this, because you did that, all of those things are okay, but I'm telling you the truth, it's not yet up to that level of agape. Agape will make you, will compel you to do what you hate, you can't do. Or you are not willing to do naturally, normally. But for that commitment to God, you give yourself to it. That's the first and the great commandment. The second commandment, Jesus said, is love your neighbor as your self. I will take them also. I will take the liberty to read. Let us read it. I just want us to read and uh, let it again, this may be stick. Exodus chapter 20 from verse 12. He said, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. That's the fifth commandment, love thy neighbor as yourself. That's your father and your mother. Sixth commandment says, Thou shalt not kill. That's still your neighbor. Seventh says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's still about your neighbor. The eighth commandment says, Thou shalt not steal. That is still about your neighbor because whatever you steal is property, something that belongs to someone else. The ninth commandment says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. You shall not bear false, false witness. Then the tenth commandment says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's belongings. You will not covet 
what belongs to your neighbor. Praise God. These commandments that are, you know, uh, divided into two, the first one talks about um, loving God. That, I, I summarize it, I call it the law of spirituality or godliness. The second one, I, 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 I term it the law of morality. Praise God. Morality. It's got to do with morality. Let's see the example of now one of those you know, religious people that came to Jesus and Jesus played out these two laws again in a different way for us to learn something. Matthew chapter 19. I will read from verse 16. Let's go to Matthew 19, 16. Once you get there, say hallelujah. Matthew 19, 16. I want to know how many people are already there with me. Once you get there, say hallelujah. I'm waiting for more people to get there. Are you there? And behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is no good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Why? Which, which one? Jesus said. Now follow me and let us see. As Jesus listed them out, is he among the moral or the spiritual? Which ones are the spiritual? The first, which has to do with relationship with God. The second is the moral, which is relationship with men, right? Okay, so now, Jesus, this man said, Jesus, what can I do? He's not asking about that law, the law of life. How can I, how can I enter into this life? Give me the rules. How can this be possible? So Jesus gave him the first set of rules. So what are those rules? He started reading, reading them. Please be mentioning it if it is spiritual or moral. Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So you see here, Jesus gave him only the moral laws. See, God wrote his moral laws. Just take the moral laws. Let's see. Even Jesus himself was only trying to test him. They come to test Jesus. Jesus too, in turn, sometimes we test them. So he gave him the set of moral laws. Ah, and the young man said, How? Ah, if you know who I be. My father was on the school teacher in my church when I was a child, and I was the, the best Sunday school student. I grew up cutting away all the prizes in Sunday school. The best behaved child. Even throughout my days in the university, the university will recognize me as a very disciplined and well-behaved person. I don't do any of this such thing. You can't, you can't even find me stealing or lying or involved in all of those things. Some, some, some. So he said, from my youth, that is from my childhood. This has been my life. He was, you know, very proud to present his credential to Jesus. So the young the Bible says the young man said to him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. So he said, What like I get? Of course, he knew that there is something missing. And Jesus said to him, If thou will be perfect, if thou will be perfect, go and say. Give to the poor 
and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Now, if you see that second law, I actually saw it as a spiritual. Love the Lord your God. But on the surface, you can see it. Is it possible for... Okay, let, let me first of all uh, state here that we have moralists. People that are, that, that you know, they, they pattern their lives after very high moral standards that don't even believe in God. They don't even believe in God. You know, yeah. praise God. Are there people like that? Yes. That you can, you can even trust them more than uh, so-called average Christian with anything. Yes, they don't believe in God. They don't even believe God exists. You know that there are people like that. So, all the good moral credentials, they are actually good. They are good testimonies. But that is actually not the thing that shows that you are connected to God. So, Jesus now gave him something higher. He said, sell all your belongings and give them to the poor. Can a moralist do that? My people cannot answer me. Can a moralist do that? Sell everything that belongs to you. I shared a story with us some time ago about one Irish billionaire who said. His ultimate aim, his ultimate goal in life is to die poor. Multi billionaire. His ultimate aim in life is to die poor. So he made all the money he made. And sometime last year, I think it was last year, when he got very old and was, was, you know, he was ready to just retire from him. He had eight billion dollars. Eight billion dollars. And he donated this to the poor, everything. And he ended up living in all this block of flats, council houses. Houses that are, you know, government just has to provide something for the poor so that people will not be homeless. He moved into that place and government officially now declared him bankrupt. He chose to do that, not that he had any, any you know, challenge with his business. He gave up every, before he died. He said he didn't want to die and then he would just do his, uh, he doesn't even want to write will about how his estate should be. No, he would do it himself before he died. And he did it sometime last year, 8 billion. It's not, uh, it was, it's not a pastor or a non religious person or a spiritual person. A moralist can also do that. A moralist who doesn't even believe in God can sum summon enough of the moral energy to still do that. And give out everything, give it to the poor. And start walking up and down in sandals. It is possible for even a person that doesn't believe in God to do this. So God gave him that rule again. And we think it's a moral thing. But, I mean, if you think it's just a moral thing, that guy, you know, his level has actually not reached that level. If his level has reached the level, he may even be able to do it. If he didn't believe him without believing in God. But here, what I saw that Jesus wanted to bring out is Bible tells me that, you know, or let me say I saw because there's, a, oh, there's another portion that Jesus looked at him intently. And he loved him. He said, Ah, but you are lacking something. There's still something in 
Jesus was able to see through him and he knew that his wealth, his wealth has taken the place of God in his life. That was actually the diagnosis that Jesus saw concerning this person. It's not that, oh, it is impossible for anybody to give out all his resources, but there is a diagnosis of the condition of this man himself. His own particular diagnosis was that his resources had taken the place of God. So God says, let go of that thing that has taken the place of God in your heart, in your life. Let go. Let go. Ah! That was his man. Do not do that. Even though he was high level moralist, when it now came to the spiritual law, a moralist is unable to stand there. You know the reason why? The spiritual always demand that you submit your will and control over your life to another entity. You submit control completely to another entity, this time God, that God is all in all, God is in charge of everything, you submit totally to him. That is the primary matter in this issue about God. That's why he said that's the first one. Submit to God. That is, thou shalt love the Lord your God. Just means that thou shalt surrender, submit to God. Submit to the ultimate ethic. That's the first. The second one is immorality, which is also good. But you know what? We men usually find it easier to submit to morality than to submit to spirituality. Why do you think that Adam did not eat from the fruit of uh, the tree of life? Did God say you should not eat from the tree of life? Go and read the Bible very well and let's find out. The tree of life and the tree of knowledge. They were together in the same place. In the garden. Amen. And God said, of, there are these two trees in the garden. And God said, this tree, don't touch it. And God was silent about this one. At the end of the day, it is that one that God said, don't touch, that eventually went to touch. How come? How come he didn't eat that touch from that tree of life? How come? If you study, if you, if you really are able to think deep about all of us, you will see something about human beings, human behaviors, the things that, that draw us, the things that make that, that we, 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 we look forward to We would rather go after the matter of knowledge than the matter of life. We will go to meetings that we are going to hear a lot of prophecies and a lot of manifestations of certain powers from God, I mean even from God. Demonstration of the power of God. And prophetic utterances and all kinds of things. In fact, if you, if you see a, a people that announces that a prophet somewhere, I, I, I don't want to even go to the negative, prophet of God is somewhere. There's a meeting that you will go. You would prefer to go to that one if it clashes with the one that uh, uh, this one teacher or you know, one man that will lead you to pray.
pray or teach you certain things. Go to the prophet. I was witnessing to somebody who I was weekly uh, evangelizing. I was to so somewhere, so I think around especially hospital some time ago. I was witnessing to two young men that they were preaching the gospel to them, and then ah, they said, "Which church?" I was a preaching church. I was just preaching Christ. Which church is your own? Uh, I mentioned the church. I said, ah, do they prophesy in that church? I said, what do you mean? Ah, he says, no, if you are not going to be prophesying and telling us future things, things that we have, we are not interested in. We are not interested in your gospel. Ah, I shook my head and said, this is how man has become. There are things, the things that actually are it's natural. Natural. Everybody desires to know new things. Everybody desires to know something that somebody else has not known before. Everybody desires to know a mystery. Let me tell you, it is not wrong. It is not evil. But it has its danger. From the garden, it was there since that time. Somebody came and told the woman, Say, You will know this thing will help you. You are going to see certain demonstrations. And they will say, Ah, oh yeah, let's try this. And they never tried the life. Way of life is usually more difficult. Because the way of life will exert a lot of demand upon your life and the way of life will, will hammer you and beat you into submission to God. We hardly want that. So this man didn't want that kind of thing. So he went away in sorrow. I'm here to submit to you people of God. Jesus said there, that way to this life is to make sure that you submit yourself to that ultimate ethic, the love of God. And love for your neighbor. Praise God. But many of us will find it easy to be moral. Morality, some of us, it's not a big deal for us. Don't steal, don't steal, don't go. But when the demand of submission to the ultimate ethic, God himself comes. We don't want to. A natural man will not want to submit his control of his life to an entity that is outside him that he cannot, he, he, he cannot have a sin. He wants to be able to have a sin. It is much easier to yield to the law of morality than to yield to the law of godliness. Praise God. This is because in the law of morality, you are in control of your decisions. But in the law of godliness, you submit control to God. And as you submit control of your life to God, you begin to draw life from God. It is only in the submission of the control of your life to God that you can draw life from Him. So that's the first instruction that you are going to be hearing about this, the way of this life or the law of this life. Submit to the ultimate ethic. Submit to agape. Submit to the love of God. Which is a love that extracts, it, it, it imposes a demand upon a person. That you, you, you don't have to like it, you have to submit to it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I conclude this message this morning by calling on you, people of God, that you are listening to me. Submit the control of your life to Him. Jesus said in John chapter 15. That famous teaching about abiding in Him. He said, You should abide in Him. And He will abide in Him. Abiding is submitting. And I saw two keys to 
guaranteed the answer to prayers in that abiding. I'll be closing this message with the two keys. John 15, verses 7 and 16. If you abide in him, John chapter 15, verse 7. If you are there, say hallelujah. Okay. He says there, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall do what? Ye shall do what? And it will be done. Is it will that is put here? Shall. Shall. That word is very important. He didn't say it will be done. He didn't say it may be done. He didn't say it can be done. He said, he shall ask and it shall be done. God's word cannot, you can't, you, you, you can't break it. This is, the, this is facts that are not broken. If you abide in him and his words abide in you, forget. Whatever you ask in his name, he will give it to you. I remember I taught somewhere, somewhere here, that Jesus said somewhere that if you, whatever you ask in my name, it shall be given. And I ask, what is whatever? Whatever is whatever. Anything you ask of. But the key is, if you are abiding in him, the thing you will ask will be what his abiding spirit moves you to ask. And it will be done. Verse 16 of that John 15 says, Ye have not chosen me. So the first one there, abide in him. That key is key to answer prayer. Guarantees. Verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and do what? And bring forth fruit. And that your fruit should remain. See it there, see the connection there. It says that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Praise God. Whatsoever you ask. He may give it to you. Key there is have fruit. Go forth and bring fruit. Be fruitful. You are going to enjoy a lot of divine provision, divine graces. But the ultimate abide in you. If you are abiding in him and his word is in you, whatever word you speak, you are speaking the word of God. Because you are vomiting out what is inside. And anything that is inside, that is any word of God, is creative word, everything must submit to it. Praise God. Everything must submit. It. I was reading something, I was I, 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 I'm taking a course somewhere and I was reading something that you know was said about why must everything submit to the word of God? Every everything except man among the whole creation, everything was created by his word. He just said, let there be, and there was everything. So anything that came to be by just his spoken word must submit to that spoken word. It's a must because their creation came to be as a result of that spoken word. It is only man that he didn't create with his spoken word. He said, let us create man in our image. And then he went to his studio. I started crafting him. And then after that, he breathed his spirit inside him. He had to do a special work on this one. 
This one has to be above all those ones. Not that it will be above the world, but it will be above all those other creatures that they are always just speaking of work. But they have to do more in addition to the world to see to it that this he, 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 he made himself, his image, he, he brought it out. So that that image is the one that will carry that word and be speaking it at all pressure of answer. So let his word abide in you. Let his word dwell in you. Know the word well. Dwell in him well. And you will, you, you will see what you will be able to do through the word. Rise to your feet. to ask the church this morning to speak peace. There is something in the spirit that requires these people to speak. I can't put my finger on it, but the word that the spirit is saying that his people should just speak peace. As you, as you command peace all over, over the land and over everything that concerns you. Somebody's life need to hear that command of peace this morning. As many as abide in him and his word abide in them, they will command peace and peace will come to pass. Can we begin to pray in the spirit and begin to declare peace? Peace over Nigeria. Peace over your marriage. Peace over your mother. Peace over the church. Peace over your territory. Peace over your space. Just speak peace as you believe it. The way you believe it, that's what's going to happen. You may not understand that you will not actually realize today that there is something, there is a need to speak peace. You will not realize it, that there is a need to speak peace. 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 Can you speak peace? Can you begin to command peace? I command peace over this land. I command peace over Nigeria. I command peace. I command peace. I command peace. Over Bagolada, I command peace. 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 In the name of Jesus. Over my space. Over my territory. I command peace. I command peace. In the name of Jesus. I command peace. Over my territory. Over this land. Over my space. I command the peace of God. Peace, 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 peace. In the name of Jesus. Peace. In the name of Jesus. Peace, 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 peace. Over everything that concerns me. Peace. Over new life. Peace, peace, peace. I command the peace of God. Peace in the name of Jesus. Peace.
as we pray and I invite anyone here who has not given his life to Jesus. If you are here, you want to give your life to Christ today. If you are here, you want to be born again today. If you are here and you, you know that if death comes today, you, are, you don't know where you will end, you are not sure. You are not sure of your end. You are not sure of where you will end up. You need Jesus today. If anyone is here and you haven't given your life to Jesus, today is another time for you. You want to give your life to Jesus this morning, I will pray a simple prayer with you. Let me just see your right hand up if you want to be born again today. You are not born again, but you want to be born again today. You want to give your life to Christ. You want to begin to follow Him. You want to abide in Him. You want to begin to live your life in Him. Let me see your right hand up while the rest of us are praying. Let me see your right hand up while the rest of us are praying. Your right hand above your head while the rest of us are praying. I want to see your right hand above your head. You want to be born again. You want to give your life to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' mighty and powerful name, we have prayed.